Hi everyone. In this Connect with Networking video, we're going to discuss Chapter 1, our Introduction to Data Communications. Let's go ahead and get started. In this chapter, we're going to discuss why networks are important, which in some cases seems self-evident, but let's discuss it. We'll talk about some of the basic network components that we use in both wired and wireless networks. We'll talk about some of the common network types. We'll get into some of the details of the network layers that we see in the modern. We'll get into some of the network layers that are used in modern networks. We'll talk about some of the standards that we currently see. And then we'll briefly touch on some of the trends we expect to see in future networking development. Networks are important because everything that we do in everyday society is driven by data. Businesses require data to make business decisions, to develop products, to reach customers, to manufacture goods, to deliver goods. Customers require networks to research various products, to discover businesses, to make reservations at a restaurant, to buy things. Everything is really reliant on all of the data that we are generating through these systems and all of the communication that's flowing from all of our various devices. So it's really hard to imagine conducting business without access to a network in modern society and access to all the data that is generated through those processes. It's difficult to get up-to-date statistics on how networks function, but even some older statistics do provide some context as to how important networks have become in recent years. Back in 2016, Cisco estimated that more than 3,000 petabytes of information were transferred over the internet every single day. Around the same time period, Netflix accounted for around a third of the primetime downstream traffic. Back in 2013, Amazon sold an average of 426 items every second during their holiday season. And you can imagine what that might be in 2020 or 2021. And back in 2012, every single day on Facebook, there were 2.7 billion likes. There were more than 300 million photos that were uploaded and more than 500 terabytes of data just in this one network. And again, these are older statistics, so you can imagine how big they must be now. Networks are obviously critical to how all of these various businesses function. In this class, we're going to talk a little bit about data communications and a subcomponent of that, which is telecommunications. We are focused on the movement of computer information from one point to another, typically using an electronic or optical transmission system. But some of the data communications that we are going to move across greater distances will use older telecommunications networks which were designed typically for transmission of voice and video, but can be used to move data, especially across greater distances. When we talk about a computer network, we typically talk about clients and servers. Clients are any device that we use to connect to the network and receive data from a server. So the common clients that you're familiar with would be things like desktop or laptop computers, your tablets, your cell phones, but they could also be a variety of other devices. Maybe your thermostat is a smart thermostat and it receives information from the internet. Maybe you have an alarm system that's connected to the cloud. All of those various devices could potentially be clients. Conversely, a server is a device that's on the network that is primarily used to transmit data to a client. And the servers that we would think about would be things like web servers or mail servers or file servers where we are hosting data and we are sharing it with various devices that connect to us. Finally, we connect our clients on our servers using circuits. This is any pathway between a client and a server. It might be a physical connection like a copper wire or a fiber optic cable, but it could also be a wireless connection like a radio signal or an infrared signal. For smaller networks, we are envisioning both servers and clients connecting to each other through some sort of networking device. In this particular picture, we're looking at a switch. We are sharing resources potentially like printers with other devices through this network. And we are reaching other networks through other network devices. In this particular picture, a router. In many cases, it's convenient to categorize our networks based upon geographic scope. 
and this is an imperfect way of doing so. There's a lot of gray area in terms of how we would define the geography of a network, but typically a small network that might contain a single room or the single floor of a building or a single small business or a single home might be considered a local area network or a LAN. Many LANs use wireless circuits, but they might also use wired networks. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish with that particular network. When you are connecting multiple networks together across greater distances, you will probably take advantage of a backbone network. These are high-speed networks. They're typically larger in size, something from hundreds of feet to several miles in distance, and their purpose is connecting other networks together. We have a campus backbone here at Texas A&M that connects various local area networks in each of the buildings to other local area networks in other buildings all over campus. If you need to communicate information even farther, you may take advantage of a wide area network. This is typically done by leasing circuits that are owned by telecommunication companies. So we're taking advantage of their existing network and we are leasing or renting their equipment to move our data across hundreds or thousands of miles. Pictorially, the way you should think about this is that a local area network is devices that are probably close enough for you to see. A backbone network would be getting information shared in your local community, your local campus, your town. And a wide area network would be reaching farther distances, towns in other states, or even in other countries. Another way that we categorize networks is in terms of how we use them. Most networks today use the same protocols and the same architectures, but how they are used might differ. An intranet is usually using the same technology as a typical internet network, but its focus is sharing information inside the organization. So we're limiting the access to that information and the users that can see that information, and maybe even the devices that can reach that information to something that's local. The infrastructure is the same as any other network, but its focus or its purpose is internal. If we expand that just a little bit and share our internal information with specific organizations or individuals outside our organization, we might call that an extranet. So this might be a supplier or customer that's partnering with our business and has access to specific parts of our internet from outside the company. And this would be an extranet. Again, the actual networking devices are probably the same as what we use anywhere else, but the focus or the purpose of the network is to share internal data with a specific outside party. Modern networks are predicated upon network models and the most common model that's used today is the internet model, also called the TCP IP model. It is a subset of the OSI or Open Systems Interconnection model, but it blurs the lines between some of the various layers and it actually redistributes some of the functionality just a little bit. We're only gonna focus on TCP IP in this class because it is effectively one. It's what's used on the internet and more and more often it's the only model that's used in local area networks and even backbone networks. So it's the only set of protocols we'll focus on in this class. The fully expanded OSI model has seven layers. Up close to the user, we have the application layer, followed by the presentation and the session layers. In the middle, we have our transport and network layers, which is how we move information across the network. And then close to the hardware, we have the data link and physical layers where we decide how we actually encode data that we want to send across the network. The internet model simplifies this just a little bit. The application layer actually includes presentation and session as part of its protocols. The transport and network layers have slightly different functionality than how they're described in the general OSI model. But we also still have the data link layer and the physical layer for the internet model. And we're going to discuss each of these layers in much more detail in later chapters. Sometimes when we talk about the internet layer, we simplify even further. We talk about the application layer, the internetwork layer, and the hardware layer. And the name internet actually comes from this combining of the 
transport and network layers into the internetwork layer. When discussing network models, we also have to discuss protocols. These are the rules that we're using in any of the layers to describe the functionality and the shape and size of the messages that are moving through that layer. When discussing protocols, an important component is the protocol data unit. This is what we're calling the message that's being moved through a specific layer in our network model. Every layer adds its own protocol data unit. Think of them as nested envelopes or nested dolls, where you're continually adding more and more layers to the data that you're sending. This process is called encapsulation. We'll talk about some of the protocols at a later time for each of these layers. And we'll also talk about some of the protocol data units, but you can see some of the names of the protocols and the protocol data units on this slide. In general, what does this process look like? Well, let's look at an example of requesting a website. This would start at the application layer, a web browser, which is making a request for a website using the HTTP protocol. That request would move down to the transport layer where we would add the TCP protocol data unit. Again, encapsulation where we're adding an additional layer. This information would move down to the network layer where we add the IP protocol data unit. We would then move down to the hardware layer where we would add the ethernet frame, another protocol data unit. And then we would convert all of that to some sort of electronic or light signal. And we would send that information to the recipient. And then the process would be reversed where we would convert that signal to an ethernet frame. We would remove that protocol data unit. We'd move it up the stack. We'd remove the next unit, the next unit, and finally receive our HTTP request at a server that can actually respond. And then the process would reverse where the server would send an HTTP response to the initial sender we'd move back down through the stack and back up through the stack in reverse process. One of the advantages to this kind of network model is that the functionality is modular. At any time we want to change something in a specific layer of the network model, we can just substitute an additional feature. We can change the protocol data unit or the rules of the protocol in that specific layer without changing anything in the rest of the network stack. It's also a lot easier to troubleshoot you can figure out exactly where things are not working and just make corrections to those specific parts of the network. This also allows application developers to only worry about things that are happening at their layer, way up at the top of the stack, and not worry about the functionality of the network in deeper layers. A disadvantage to this structure is that it is relatively inefficient. You have to keep on adding protocol data units as you move down and down and down the stack. And then you have to remove all of those layers when you move back up the stack. So it's not a particularly efficient process, but we found that it is very effective in delivering the content that is needed from point A to point B without any errors, without any hiccups in service. And so this has been a widely adopted, so this has been the widely adopted network model for decades. Networks tend to follow network standards. This is a means of ensuring that our hardware and our software from various vendors work together and speak the same language. Think about how your uh, iPhone can communicate with somebody that's using an Android phone and vice versa, or you can use a Mac and you can still access the internet and communicate with someone who's using a PC. If you didn't have standards, various vendors would be using equipment that could not communicate with other vendors. And that has been the case in the past. But for the most part now, we don't see too much of that because we have good standards in place. Some standards are de jure standards that are formalized by an industry or a government body. Things like the HTTP protocol or our wired or wireless protocols are formalized by the IEEE organization. Other standards are de facto standards. They're not formalized, but they are widely accepted. So for example, like it or not, the most common operating system in the business world is Microsoft Windows. It's the standard, it's what we're gonna most likely expect on a client. Sometimes de facto standards eventually become de jure standards because they're so widely accepted. 
The de jure standardization process is an organization coming up with some specifications, identifying the possible choices that will satisfy those specifications, and then accepting the new changes to the standard as the latest version. So it's a very rigorous process and often takes a long period of time. Because we exist in this environment where we have some de jure standards and some de facto standards, there are often lots of competing standards in certain environments, which reminds me of this XKCD comic where somebody comes along and says that we definitely could come up with one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases, which sounds like a brilliant idea, but typically that just adds one more standard to the stack. Again, we'll talk about some of these common standards when we get to the specific layer discussions in later chapters, but you probably recognize some of these standards just by using a computer and being on a network and participating on the internet. So we'll talk about some of these terms that you're probably familiar with in more detail in later chapters. What are some of the trends that are steering the way that networking is developing over time? Well, probably the biggest one is the idea of bring your own device. And we're currently experiencing that, of course, in this class where everybody is expected to have their own laptop of some sort so that they can participate online in this class. There's a huge demand for employees being able to connect their personal devices to their organizational networks. And this provides a variety of different challenges, not least of which is the security challenge. If you're letting devices that are not owned and controlled by the organization to connect to the network, what does that do to your security? Certainly, we also have to think about things like support. If you are encouraging your users to use personal devices for work purposes and they have a technical issue, who's responsible for troubleshooting that issue? Another trend that has really taken off in recent years is the idea of the web of things where everything can connect to a network. Your thermostat, your refrigerator, your shoes, your garage doors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there are obviously some great advantages to having things connected to your local network and to the internet, but that increases the demand on your network and it certainly increases the possibility of security issues. So lots of things worth considering. Another trend that we've seen in recent years is movement towards massively online platforms. This term first was used with gaming, but other arenas like online courses have adopted massively open online environments where millions of people can participate in online classes. And of course, most of us use a variety of different social media platforms to communicate with our friends and family. As these various massively online environments continue to expand, we'll need more and more network infrastructure to support the vast amount of data that's moving from place to place. Every chapter in this class wraps up with an implications for management. When you are working in a business environment in the management role, you need to be thinking about the fact that networks have changed almost everything in terms of how we operate our businesses. Today's networking is driven by standards and most networks are predicated on the same standards, which has simplified the process greatly in recent years. The biggest challenge for management is that as our network demand increases, we'll need additional resources in terms of storage and in terms of bandwidth. So staying on top of the needs of our employees and our customers will definitely be a challenge moving forward. That's it for this chapter. Thanks so much for watching and listening. See you next time.